Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this mayoral candidate forum sponsored in part by the Florence Civic Business Association as well as the Bay State Village Association. We would like to first thank our candidates, Mr. Bardley, Bardsley and Mr. Narkowitz, for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be here with us tonight. At this time, I'd like to ask you to please mute any electronic devices in the room the, so that we may uh, get through this without any interruption. We would also like to thank the staff here at the high school for allowing us to have this forum in this beautiful auditorium and uh, for the student staff that has volunteered to be here this evening. Please give them a big round of applause. And among those that we have to thank is uh, the Northampton Community Television Station, who is actually taping this as we speak, and will be broadcasting this on their channel at a later time, as well as putting it up on their website, from what I understand. My name is Tom McCusker. I am uh, a member of the Bay State Village Association, and I will be moderating this evening. We do have a few rules to go over, but first, a couple other things that I was asked to mention. Uh, please uh, remember to pick up one of our flyers. It has uh, a couple of different other forums coming up, such as the Community Preve Preservation Act Forum, which is Wednesday, October 26th at 7 o'clock at the JFK Middle School Community Room. The League of Women Voters will have a forum hearing arguments uh, for and against passing the question that would repeal the CPA. These flyers uh, will be, um, I believe that, oops, I don't think I'm supposed to read that, but that's okay. Um, these flyers are going to be circulating both outside and inside. Please make sure you get one of these so you know uh, what's going on in your city. The rules for tonight's forum are very simple. Each candidate will be given a two-minute opening statement. Before we begin tonight, the candidates, well, we were going to draw straws. We ended up throwing a coin <laughs> to see who would be given the first question. As a result of this, the first question will go to Mr. Bardsley tonight. And then Mr. Narkowitz will have the opportunity. It was the other way around? Yeah. OK. I do, I do the opening, the first statement. Oh, the fr that's right. I'm it's sorry. Mr. Bardsley there. will get the first opening statement. I'm sorry. I jumped ahead. Uh, Mr. Narkowitz will be able to answer the first question first. And we will alternate from there. Each candidate will be given two minutes to respond to each question. And the question will be repeated for each candidate if necessary. There will be a 30-second uh, time allotment for the first candidate to rebut the second candidate's answer. Each candidate is asked to stick to the topic of the question at hand and not make any personal attacks on the other candidate. At the end, each candidate will be given a two-minute closing statement time period. So unless, unless there's any questions about the rules, we will go ahead with our first question. Are we all set? Opening statement. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, just to give you a little bit of background here, I had this thing printed out and it was all set to go and then I gave it to these guys and now there's all kinds of numbers and X's and so I'm trying to follow along, so please bear with me. So yes, Mr. Barsley, if you would, with okay. your opening thank statement. You. Uh, thank you to the Bay State Village Association and the Flor Florence Civic and Business Association for hosting tonight's forum, thank you. For the first time in 12 years, the voters will be hiring a new mayor for Northampton. There is a job vacancy, and you, the voters, are the employers. Two of the major considerations in evaluating the candidate's credentials should be experience and leadership. I am the candidate with the strongest resume. For over three decades, I have been a hardworking, diligent, conscientious public servant. I have served 16 years on the city council, eight years as president, and have chaired or been a member of almost every uh, city council committee. Also, I have a proven record as a champion of public education, 33 years as classroom teacher, guidance counselor, department head, and administrator. My record of leadership demonstrates my ability to work with a wide range of individuals regardless of their social position or political beliefs, the courage to take a stand on controversial issues, and the vision to help build this wonderful community where many folks, including David, have chosen to move and raise their families. I have never aspired to be a politician. 
I am a public servant. I have the depth and the breadth of experience to be everybody's mayor of Northampton. Thank you. Mr. Narkowitz. Yeah. Thank you, and I want to also begin by thanking the Bay State Village Association and the Florence Civic and Business Association for sponsoring tonight's debate. I believe Northampton is an excellent place to live, to work, to learn, to run a business, and to raise a family. I'm running for mayor because I want to keep Northampton strong and I want to make it better. I believe I am the candidate with the experience, the positive vision, and the proven record of leadership to move our great city forward. I was born and raised in Western Mass in a large working class family of nine kids. My parents taught me the value of hard work and instilled a strong ethic of community involvement and service. I served my country in the Air Force after high school, was a student leader at UMass, worked as a congressional aide both in Washington and here in Massachusetts, and have been an active volunteer in our community, schools, and local government. During my three terms on the City Council, I've been a positive and productive representative and a leader for our city. I've never shied away from tough issues or hard work. I brought people together to create innovative solutions and tangible results to improve our community. Since announcing my candidacy, I've knocked on hundreds of doors and sat in dozens of kitchens and living rooms across our city, listening and sharing ideas and concerns. Concerns about creating economic opportunity and jobs, keeping our city livable and affordable, maintaining strong public schools, delivering smart, cost-effective city services, protecting our environment and keeping Northampton green and sustainable, fostering active neighborhood and citizen participation, and leading a government that is open, fair, and transparent. Tonight, I'm looking forward to talking about these and other issues. It's an honor to be a candidate for mayor and to be running for this important office with Michael Bardsley. I look forward to a great discussion this evening. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. So as I mentioned, the first question will be answered uh, in turn uh, by Mr. Narkowitz first. As you uh, both have alluded to throughout your campaign, this is the first time that we'll be electing a new mayor in the last 12 years. What unique challenges will you, uh, as mayor, face following a six-term mayor, and what have you learned from your predecessor? Mr. Narkowitz, you have first opportunity at this question. Well, I think it is a great opportunity. I think we have, after 12 years of one administration, we have an opportunity for a fresh look, uh, somebody who's a new leader, someone who has new ideas, uh, and can take a fresh approach to some of the big problems that we're facing. In terms of what some of those big problems are, I think the, uh, you know, the perennial issue is always our budget. It's trying to figure out you know, how do we uh, pay for the services that people depend on every day? How do we keep the quality schools? How do we take care of our roads and our sidewalks? Uh, these are some of the challenges that the next mayor will, will inherit from the previous mayor and will have to, uh, and will have to tackle. In terms of learning from the previous administration, I think you know, my, my, uh, my style is going to be a slightly different in terms of my approach to many of the issues. I think, um, I think the budget which I raised is one of those. I think, we need to, uh, I think we need to take a look at are there ways we can do things differently? Are there ways we can innovate? Are there ways that we can look at uh, collecting data within our city to figure out if there's different ways that we can improve services? Um, I think the budget process itself I think I want to put a different, uh, my own mark on the budget process. Uh, I think the idea of trying to get more citizen input before I release my budget, to try to get input on what are the priorities, what are the values that people have uh, as I put together my budget and then bring it to the city council. Um, so that's, I think that's one of the key issues and underlying that budget issue is of course, you know, how do we create economic opportunity in the city? Because part of the, one of the key ways that we can um, provide the resources that we need to fund our budget is by expanding our tax base and by trying to create opportunity, economic opportunity. So I think the, the idea of trying to keep our budget, uh, trying to put together a budget that can meet the needs and services uh, that our citizens demand, uh, but doing it in the context of how do we also grow and strengthen our economy so that there are jobs and that the city remains livable uh, for all of our residents. Mr. Bardsley, do you need me to repeat the question? I do not. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there are some uh, unique challenges uh, following uh, an incumbent who has been in office for uh, 12 years. 
Uh, Mayor Higgins did a, an excellent job on many fronts. They built a solid base of how the city operates. And um, there, you, the challenge is, is to build from that base and, and to move forward. At the same time, when someone has been in office for 12 years, there's a lot of practices that are ingrained that people are used to um, doing, operating things the, the way they have done, done them. So it's going to be a challenge, I think, to bring in um, changes. And I think there are a number of areas where it, it merits looking at doing things uh, differently. Uh, uh, David mentioned one of them is the, uh, the budget process. I will revamp the budget process, start that earlier. I intend to in, um, include employees into the uh, budget process to get information from them and recommendations from them. They are the, uh, the in, inside of the, uh, of the, the city operations and they have recommendations. They have not been heard for a while. Um, another one is I would uh, strengthen our economic uh, development uh, outreach. I think we, there's an opportunity to uh, support our local businesses. I've spent three days so far walking around downtown Northampton and downtown Florence, and I've had heard from those who own and operate our local businesses, and there is a major disconnect with city government. There's a lot of discontent from local business people, and I think the city can do a lot better in promoting and working with local businesses. And I'm also concerned with the employee morale, and I will work with employees and um, uh, to get them involved and, and talk to them. And the overall, the decision-making process has to be more open and more transparent. Mr. Narquist, do you have a rebuttal? Uh, no, only just to add that, uh, you know, I think in terms of uh, looking at my record in city government, the time that I've spent on the city council, I think looking at reforming the budget process, uh, trying to get more information on our city's website, uh, contracts, salaries, those are the things that I've pushed for. I also think in the area of economic development, um, that's an area where I feel I have special expertise. Um, was the former economic development director for John Olver, our local congressman, and have done a lot of work in that area. So that's something that I think I can bring a special focus from my experience. And uh, so those would be some of the things that I would just add to my, uh, to my initial response. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. The next question will start with Mr. Bardsley. On November, on November 8th, Northampton will be voting on a question that would repeal the Community Preservation Act, also known as the CPA. Are you in favor of Northampton maintaining the CPA, or are you in favor of its repeal? And explain, please. Uh, I was the, uh, the council who brought the uh, CPA before the, uh, the city council on uh, two different occasions. The first time I brought it forward, it, um, it did not pass. It did not get the majority support of the, uh, the council at that time. And that was to put it on the ballot, I believe. And um, it did not have the support of the mayor at the, at the time. There was a concern from the mayor that that would be in competition with a, uh, an override, and she wasn't in favor of having a competition um, for the override that was expected to come up. And uh, a few years later, I, and along with the, some other councilors, brought it forward again, and it made it on the ballot um, for, uh, for citizens to vote on. Uh, they. Uh, whether or not, I, I think the, uh, the CPC has done uh, a lot of wonderful hard work, has supported a lot of great projects. Um, and I'm very proud of what has been accomplished as a result, result of that. Whether or not the citizens um, uh, feel that they can afford and it's a worthwhile investment remains to be seen in the course of the discu discussion. I personally uh, support it, but I think we need to make an argument of what are the projects that are um, going to benefit the city, going to benefit the citizens. We have to be cognizant of the fact that many working middle class folks are being hit very hard from a number of different directions. And although for some the average uh, fee for the, the CPA seems uh, not substantial, uh, that isn't true for all of our neighbors. So I think it's up to each of uh, the, the families and uh, the individuals to make that decision. Um, I personally support it. I think it has a good track record of accomplishing a, a number of great things. Thank you. Mr. Narkowitz. Uh, just 
to begin, I just want to correct the record. The, the CPA was not uh, put on the ballot by the City Council uh, in 2005. I wasn't on the Council, but uh, it was very clearly put on the ballot by citizens who, who got signatures and collected signatures and, uh, and put it on the ballot, which is why now, five years later, citizens are doing the same thing. Under the law, they're collecting signatures, and they've put it back on the ballot. Um, uh, I supported the CPA when it was uh, first uh, enacted by the City. Um, I've certainly been involved, having been on the City Council now during the five years that it's been in place, seeing all the projects that have come through. I definitely believe that uh, it's, been a, it's been an important funding stream for the City that's allowed us to do some important things in open space preservation and affordable housing and in, uh, in creating uh, recreation fields um, and historic preservation. Uh, and so, I, and I also believe that it's been a way for us to pay for things that we haven't been able to pay for out of the general fund to leverage new monies that we brought in from outside the city. Um, I, uh, I support the CPA, uh, and I'm going to uh, going to vote to oppose repealing the CPA. Um, I do agree that it's a it's a decision that that every family has to look at and to make. I just hope we have a really good debate about it and that there's a good discussion about it because I do think that the value that it's added to our community has been beneficial. I also think there's great exemptions that are in place in terms of exempting the first hundred thousand dollars of value on your home, uh, exemptions for elderly and for low income, which I think are really important that that those are in place. And I also think the process has been a real model in terms of uh, best practices, in terms of an open process. Uh, they've they've uh, done a lot of work. They have a great website with all of the information about the various proposals uh, that are on there. Um, so I think it's important for people to, uh, to see the projects that have been funded um, and really think about this one carefully. But I support the CPA and will vote to re not to repeal it. Mr. Barsley, do you have a rebuttal for this? Yeah, uh, yes, the, uh, m my memory of the votes, and I would have to go back and check the record, is that the, the City Council did have two votes, and I, I know they didn't put it on the ballot. I, th I think they had to agree to uh, st start the process. But I do remember that there were uh, two votes in involved and that there was a shift in on, on the, the City uh, uh, Council at the time. But the first time around, um, there was opposition to it, and as well as the, uh, the mayor was skeptical. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the next question actually is going to go to Mr. Narkowitz first. Does the city government function efficiently? <laughs> That's a loaded question. I think a lot of people would agree. Can you describe the management and budgeting process you would use to make sure that the city uses resources wisely? That's a great question, because one of the things that I've been talking about um, uh, out, in, out on the campaign talking to people uh, about this issue is, you know, how can we go ahead and make our city services as efficient, as effective, as cost effective as we can? Um, I think it's something that, that uh, is an important piece of what I want to try to bring to city government. Um, I think I talked, alluded to it in one of my previous answers. I think there's a, there's a whole movement right now uh, called City Stat, where we're actually, uh, cities and towns around the, around the Commonwealth are actually trying to take a look at the city services they provide and really try to quantify them and try to, try to get good data on how those services work um, so that they can then communicate with voters about what those services cost and also be able to make decisions about how to prioritize and how to, how to improve those services. So for example, you know, we, we talk a lot about potholes and about road repair. Uh, you know, to be able to quantify you know, how much it costs to actually you know, repair so many feet of road um, what the time involved, and begin to collect some of that information so that we can make smart decisions. I also think we've done a lot of work in terms of consolidating departments, in terms of regionalization opportunities. You know, our Board of Health now uh, has, has, has a regional focus. Our Veteran Services has a regional focus. Um, so I think there's some opportunities there as well uh, to, to look at regionalization where we can combine with other communities to deliver the same services and save money. So I think there's a lot of ways that we can do that. I have a record in city government of innovation, of, of not being afraid to think outside the box, to, to, to take new ideas and try to bring them to city government. And I think that will serve me well in the, in the role of mayor uh, to be able to go ahead and look at what are the ways that we can go ahead and deliver city services in the most cost-effective way, uh, saving the taxpayers money and preserving the re precious resources we have so we can spread it around and do the things that we want to do as a community? Thank you. Mr. Barsley. 
Uh, David spoke a lot of the technical side of it. I, I, I would really focus on the people side of the process. And uh, for example, um, you know, the, the mayor, when she presents, uh, has presented the budget, she talks about the, uh, the city budget is really reflecting the heart and soul of the city because that shows our priorities. And so one would think that the, uh, the, the budget and the budget hearings would generate the largest crowds and the most uh, interest of, of the cities. And in fact, uh, the opposite is true. Um, there have been occasions uh, this year, I, think, I don't think there were more than four citizens in the, uh, the audience at any one time for the two uh, budget here, uh, the city council bu budget hearings. And in fact, um, on uh, the first one, there were only five councillors, one left early. Uh, the second one, I think there were five councillors. And then when there was a joint hearing with the school committee, um, we had to wait 15 minutes for a quorum of the, uh, the city council. And I think that's problematic. And I think that is a sign of a system that's sort of uh, broken. And I think it shows that people don't really take the current process seriously. If they did, they would have made a commitment, they, they would have made it a priority to be there. So I think we need to start earlier. I think we need to involve citizens. I would have a citizens advisory committee. It would help me uh, look through the budget. I would, as I said earlier, I would meet with employees and get the uh, inside uh, view of employees on the various uh, budgets. We need to set goals. We need to have uh, priorities. There's been a lot of spending that has been done in the, uh, the last two years where there's been question of whether or not the city really needed what was being purchased. So um, those are the things that I would do to uh, make a more open democratic process. Mr. Darker, do you have rebuttal for this? Yeah, just, uh, just to say that, I mean, I think one of the reasons that I was speaking about the trying to, trying to get some of that data and trying to put better numbers out there is I think that's how you engage the people in the process is that if you can put these numbers out that people can understand in their daily lives and to try to put, a, uh, put s s some data out there that people can understand in terms of road repairs, in terms of potholes, in terms of schools, in terms of those kinds of things, and really try to engage people. So I think one of the roles of the mayor is to do a better job of communicating, of, of making the budget uh, easier for people to understand and to start that process as early as possible. Thank you very much, gentlemen. The next question will be going to Mr. Bardsley first. Both of you supported the decision to preclude expansion of the landfill, thus calling for it to close when it reaches capacity in 2012. How do you reconcile this decision with the lack of consideration given to the costs of trash disposal alternatives? Do you also believe that the State Department of Environmental Protection acted rashly or in some other way improperly by approving the landfill expansion despite being above the Barnes Aquifer? I think the, uh, the landfill is a good example of um, how the city really failed to take the proper leadership on a very, very important issue. Um, the information that came on the, on the landfill um, did not come all at once. It, did, it came in bits and pieces. A lot of times it was in reaction to concerns uh, by citizens or the hardworking counselor from Ward 6, Mary Ann Labarge, was constantly pushing the, the mayor and the mayor's office to get information to her citizens and to protect their, uh, their well-being and their health. And uh, it, it sh that isn't where a decision should be made. In the beginning, it, the options, all the options should have been uh, put out there and given due consideration and there should have been a, a, a discussion on, on the merits of that one possibility. The, um, the decision to close the landfill by this council, which I, in fact I did not vote on because I was a member of the council when they took that vote, but the, uh, the decision to close came after the citizens had voted. There was a non-binding referendum and it failed in every precinct in the city. And that was put on by the citizens. The city council failed to put it on. That was put on the ballot by the citizens. And they gave the city the opportunity to convince voters that it was needed, that it was a viable uh, alternative, that um, they would not be putting the water supply or people's health at risk. And the city failed to convince the citizens in every single precinct, not just the ones around the landfill. 
So I think it is, there's a lot of wisdom to closing the landfill, um, pushing very aggressively on uh, re recycling and reuse programs, and that's exactly what I said two years ago. Thank you very much, Mr. Narkowitz. Yeah, in terms of the decision, uh, you know, I, I, I will agree with Councilor, uh, former Councilor Bardsley that, uh, that it was a long, very long process uh, that started, you know, decades ago with the acquisition of the land, uh, then moving forward into the, to the next phases where the permitting process started. Um, and then uh, it was very frustrating in terms of the, the, the way that the city council was in a role to be a zoning authority over this process. We weren't our traditional public policy role. We were in a very awkward position of being a zoning body that was not allowed to really engage in the issue. Um, that was a process that I tried to change uh, at the end of, of the last term. I tried to uh, put forth legislation to try to change that so that the city council could have an opportunity to weigh in and, and have a policy debate. Um, but as it turned out, uh, the, 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 the referendum passed, the board, of, uh, uh, the board of Public Works and the mayor both decided they would not move forward with the landfill decision uh, to, to submit, to expand. And so as city council president, uh, I believe that the most imp important thing at that point was we need to start thinking about what the alternative is when the landfill closed. Um, calling for a, a task force, uh, which I ended up serving on, to go ahead and look at what are the things that we're going to need to do without a landfill. Uh, looking at things like do we keep our transfer stations, do we move to a different system. Uh, looking at how do we increase our recycling, how do we increase our reuse, uh, how do we go ahead and, and uh, ramp up our compost program, which we began as a pilot. Um, so, you know, I think what we had to do when that decision was made uh, was to go ahead and evaluate what are we going to do now that we don't have a landfill, the landfill is going to close, um, and so I think what we've tried to do is, is move to that next conversation about, you know, what are going to be the costs, what are going to be the implications, what kind of a system are we going to have uh, moving forward. Thank you. Mr. Barsley, do you have rebuttal for this? Uh, yes, the, uh, the awkward role that uh, the City Council was uh, placed in that David referred to is in fact a role that the City Council has been placed in previously and it never created the degree of uh, problems and turmoil that it did this time around and there, it seemed to be that the rules were interpreted a little bit differently than they had been in the past with this imposition of the alleged uh, gag rule. Um, the, the point about thinking about alternatives should have been done earlier. And that's it. Thank you, gentlemen. The next question is going to start with Mr. Narkowitz. A uh, very small question this time. <laughs> is the city pursuing the right set of goals? What policy objectives of the Higgins administration would you change if you became mayor? Simple question. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think one of the, I think one of the roles of a, of a new mayor is to go ahead and, and partly to evaluate you know, what's been going on in the city, what sorts of programs are working, what programs aren't working correctly, and to kind of lay out a vision for where you want to take the city. Um, I think we do, we're doing a lot of things well. I think there's a, you know, we have a lot of success in terms of uh, you know, awards that we've won, in terms of, you know, some, of the, some of the activity that's happening in our, in our downtowns. We have you know, strong local businesses. We've seen some recent expansion of our, of our commercial base. I think those are all positive signs. Um, in terms of the things that I would do differently, I do think we need to really put an added focus on economic development. I think that's one of the keys, as we, particularly in a time when we have you know, less and less state aid, less and less, no federal aid practically. So I think that would be one of the emphasis that I would put on um, is, is how do we be more proactive in that regard? You know, how do we reach out to the local businesses that we have and also reach out to entrepreneurs and, and, and potential new businesses to try to attract them? I've called for creating an economic development advisory commission. Um, uh, we've, we've had success in the areas of transportation and in energy where we've put together a commission of, of experts, of citizens, of staff to really focus on a problem. And I think we need to have the same focus uh, in the area of economic development. Um, so I think that would be probably the, the one thing that I would put forward in terms of where I'd like to see a shift in emphasis. Um, I think we're doing great stuff on, in many other areas of city government. I also think we have to work on continuing to make the process more open, uh, more inclusive, bringing more people into city government. I think I would take a different approach in terms of 
um, my appointment process to city bodies. I'd like to try to bring in more people into, into, uh, into city committees and commissions and try to bring some fresh new energy into city government. So I think we have an opportunity with the new mayor after 12 years to do some of those things, and those would be some of the things that I would work on. Thank you. Mr. Bardsley. Um, there's a number of things that I would uh, uh, work on. Some of them overlap with what David just referred to. Uh, I would revamp the budgeting process, and I made some comments about that earlier. Um, I would also look at the, uh, the city's uh, revenue stream and to see if there's ways to uh, d diversify our, our revenue. Uh, is there other ways that we can be getting revenue in the city without um, increasing the burden on our taxpayers and small businesses? And it's, it's not a new idea, but a, an idea I'm, I'm ready to uh, resurrect and to look at it and, and provide leadership on. And I think that's the, that has been the missing in, ingredient, is um, looking at the properties that, of which um, legally they are exempt from taxes. Um, we have a considerable amount of property in the city that belongs to uh, uh, nonprofits who uh, legally have the right to not pay taxes on them. And there is a concept called payment in lieu of taxes. The mayor of Boston has launched a program um, to try to get a voluntary participation over five years, um, and his goal is 25%. If the city of Northampton was able to get 10% uh, collected on, its, on the, uh, the value of the property that exempt, um, that would provide over a million dollars to the city. Uh, based on the research I have done with the assessor's office. So I think that's an opportunity to bring in new revenue, and that's a lot of that revenue I would earmark for infrastructure, because we are headed into a very, very severe problem maintaining our roads and our other infrastructure. And that gives us an opportunity. It's going to have to take a public dialogue, and it will be a, um, a, a process that's voluntary. Also, economic development, I would push a higher local program. And so our businesses are thinking about hiring local people so that uh, dollars stay within the community. Thank you. Mr. Darkwish, do you have rebuttal? I think the, the pilot discussion is a good one. I've followed uh, Mayor Menino's work in terms of uh, uh, coming up with a program where he actually did the assessments on people's uh, nonprofit properties in Boston and began that dialogue. I think that's a good one. I've heard that a lot when I've been out uh, talking to people at coffee hours and and knocking on doors, that that's something that they want us to look at um, as well. So that would be something that I would also uh, uh, look at and focus on as well. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. The next question will go to Mr. Bardsley first. A great emphasis has been placed on making Northampton an attractive and socially welcoming town, signage, plantings, uh, parks, etc. Right now, as you enter Northampton from various roadways, you see people holding paper signs asking for money. How do you reconcile the desire for an aesthetically pleasing city with our social responsibility of helping those in need? When I was uh, going around, especially in downtown Northampton, um, one of the uh, concerns I'd heard from shop owners over and over again was that um, the downtown is no longer the attractive place that uh, it used to be in some ways. In some ways it has Im improved because of the bid and the services of the bid replaced uh, some of the services the city stopped doing 10 years ago. But in terms of um, people are not feeling safe um, downtown and they, uh, whether it's, it's true or not, their reactions of that, there are some people who, who seem to be threatening to them or, um, or make them feel uncomfortable. Um, I think there's a, a way to a, a approach that and deal with, the, with that problem. Um, it isn't necessarily homelessness. It isn't necessarily that these uh, uh, people are, um, are threatening to people. Uh, a lot of times people are passing judgments on them because they look differently. But I think there's a, uh, a way to approach that problem. Um, I have spoken to some of the people who hang out on the streets and, and uh, during various uh, times recently. And it, it, if we have an, uh, uh, a desire to make that work, I think we can deal with that problem. Um, one piece of that problem, I think, is related to uh, drugs and drug trafficking. And we have to be, uh, get over, we have to get over our fear of mentioning that as a problem in the city. 
and I'm not saying it's a huge problem or it's bigger than any other community's problem, but that is, there, is, uh, there are drugs present. You can, anybody who reads the paper can see a number of instances where um, that has created some situations, and I think we can systematically deal with that uh, issue, and I think that would go a long way of cleaning up some of the city streets. Mr. Narkowitz. Yeah, this is, uh, this is also an issue that I've heard from, from, uh, from shopkeepers and from folks who live and work downtown. Um, and it's an issue that I've, that I've been working uh, within city government on. We, we did uh, pull together recently within, within this year a group of business owners who had this concern. Uh, we brought in folks from social service agencies, uh, the social workers that are out on the streets, uh, to talk about what are some of the solutions. We brought in law enforcement as well to really think about you know, what are the ways that we can try to, uh, to try to address this problem? And it is a sensitive issue. Uh, there's obviously, L there's, there are parts of it that involve, you know, people that need access to social services that we have to try to make sure we can provide and, and, uh, and guide them to. There's also a policing uh, part of it as well. You know, we do try to have a, a, a neighborhood uh, police presence downtown with a, a, an officer who's on foot patrol or on bike patrol. Um, and, and I think there's also communication with business owners uh, between the city and business owners and trying to get um, uh, business owners, if they see problems or issues, to report them so that we can try to respond in a way uh, and, and, be, and also be proactive about it as well. Um, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a problem. It's complicated. I mean, part of what makes downtown downtown is sort of the, the, the great mix of people that are there, the musicians, uh, the people that are, that are there. Um, coming on weekends to, to enjoy the, the scene that's down there. I think that's a good thing, a positive thing, and I wouldn't want to see us try to sanitize that in any way. Um, uh, but it is a concern uh, for business and for safety, and I think it's something that we have to have a dialogue, that city government has to have a dialogue with the downtown uh, about. And it's something that I've been part of as city council president, and it's something that I would continue uh, as mayor. Thank you. Mr. Barsley, do you have a rebuttal? Yes, um, I, I think the, uh, the downtown is uh, an area that the city has dropped the ball on and, and the problems, some of the problems have gotten worse. When I was uh, city council, uh, on the city council representing Ward 4, I formed a downtown citizens forum as well as a business advisory committee that kind of um, act as troubleshooting some of those problems that were occurring. Um, neither of those entities survived after I left but we need to start that dialogue again. Excellent, thank you. Uh, both of you have mentioned uh, jobs at one time or another, the economic situation within not just Northampton but surrounding communities. How will you address the need for economic, de sorry, <laughs> economic development and the expansion of Northampton's tax base? And this question goes to Mr. Narkowitz first. Uh, I think I mentioned some of that in my previous, uh, one of my previous responses, but I do think it's something that we have to look at. It's something we have to try to have a strategy for. I think it's something that, um, you know, we, we have, our community is so well poised. We have a well-educated workforce. We have, uh, you know, beautiful downtowns. We have great amenities. We have strong school system. So I feel like we have all the attributes. We don't have a lot of developable land. Um, but I think we have a lot of opportunities. King Street is a perfect example. Uh, we have opportunities in Main Street, Village Hill. There's still work to be done there. Uh, and I think that takes uh, hands-on leadership by the mayor. It takes coming up with a strategy and a vision. Um, and, and so I mentioned earlier the idea of putting together this advisory commission on economic development to try to work on setting some of those goals and some strategies. I also think we have opportunities uh, in tourism. Uh, which is an important part of our of our economic base. Which is um, we, we just got a brand new system set up, the Hampshire Regional uh, Tourism Bureau, which I think is going to be a great opportunity for better marketing of Northampton. Um, and then, of course, the key thing is we have a great uh, local business base right here in Northampton. We have many local businesses that are family owned that have been here for many years. They're unique to the character of Northampton. So I also think we have to make sure that we're um, attending to those businesses as well. Uh, one of the things I used to do when I was uh, economic development director for John Olver was we had a, a business visitation program where we'd make sure we had regular visits with businesses. We try to collect data. We try to work with them to figure out what their needs are. I think the city had something like that at one point, um, and that's something that I'd like to try to revisit 
Um, I mean, it's important. I mean, as 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 a city councilor, as a citizen, I'm out all the time. I'm I'm in local businesses, but I think it's important to have a real systematic approach to that, so that you're checking in on businesses and understanding what the needs are and and what kinds of services the city can provide to try to keep them supported and keep our economy strong, so that we're creating jobs, uh, good jobs for people here locally. Mr. Bardsley. Uh, Northampton is a, uh, a unique community, and I don't think we have used our assets very well in terms of economic development. Uh, one of the, uh, my observations around uh, Northampton is what, what is good for Northampton is good for business. And I think in most communities, it's the other way around. It's what's good for business is good for community X. But in, and um, a, an example of that, um, as a counselor, I was the, I proposed the uh, Downtown Architectural Review Committee. And there was a lot of resistance from that from uh, businesses, and they thought it was another layer of bureaucracy and it was going to have a negative uh, effect on, their, on the business downtown. But in fact, it proved the other way around and they won awards and the business community rallied around that once it was passed. And I think there's a, that is the role of the, the leader of the city, to look at things that need to happen to improve Northampton and to convince the business community that this is good for business because it's good for Northampton. Um, there are, I think there's an opportunity to promote more green businesses here. Um, I, I, another missed opportunity is co-ops. We have two very successful co-ops in the city. It, we have a lot of expertise in this area at UMass, at GCC, and with people who could help uh, worker-owned businesses. And I think that's another whole area that we need to look at. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I would lead an effort around a higher local campaign. Um, we are losing jobs, not only in construction jobs, but a lot of the larger uh, entities in uh, town, the, uh, the institutions, larger businesses, when they go on an um, advertising campaign or a, a promotional campaign, a lot of times they take their business out of the city. They go to New York. I would argue for them to keep, we have the talented people here, we could hire local. Mr. Narkowitz, uh, rebuttal. Uh, no rebuttal, I just want to add some additional information to my previous answer, and that was um, I think one of the other great opportunities that we have to assist local businesses is in the area of energy. And I've been part of putting together a program uh, that we've just, just uh, announced a couple of weeks ago called uh, Leading, Northampton uh, Leading the Way, which is a program where we're actually going out to try to help businesses reduce their energy usage, which is a major cost driver in terms of the expense of running a business. So we've partnered with CET, with our two local utilities, and we're going actually out to try to help them reduce their energy costs. I think that's another key area. How can we help businesses um, in terms of that major driver uh, in their bottom line? Thank you. I'm um, going to change the questions around a little bit. I just, uh, this other one seems to be a little bit related to what we were just talking about. Both Florence and the Bay State Village uh, have been recognized as areas to promote infill. Would the prospect of increasing population density would lead to greater demands being put on infrastructure, roads, sewers, and et cetera. How do you plan to address the city's dis, uh, deteriorating infrastructure in light of increasing demands? And this question goes to Mr. Bardsley first. Well, as, as I said earlier, I think um, I would lead the effort to generate uh, new revenue so we have monies to address a deteriorating uh, infrastructure. We cannot do it within the current budget without making some se severe uh, sacrifices on current services and um, to pass it on directly to the, uh, uh, the taxpayers I think would be a burden for a lot of people, especially when we're looking at uh, some other increases. So um, that is where I, I think I would uh, look for relief from the program of having a payment in lieu of taxes and uh, work with the, uh, those institutions in the, the community to try to work them up to the point where they can um, pay uh, up to 10 percent is the, the, the figure I've uh, started with um, of their property values and to earmark that for infrastructure because those institutions use our infrastructure. Um, the, when you talk about infill, uh, I, I think we need to look at that carefully. There are various types of infill. I live in a neighborhood 
that has had infill and there, uh, there's some infill that enhance a neighborhood and then there's other uh, types of infill that challenge a uh, kind of the character of the neighborhood. And I think we, that's one of the areas where we need to include citizens so they know what is being proposed and they have a clear understanding of how it's going to impact uh, their neighborhood. Um, there has been a lot of concern and, uh, uh, and fear, and sometimes it's been justified, sometimes not, around the impact of infill. Uh, there's a project uh, in my neighborhood that has been very controversial, and I think we need to be very careful to look at very, the large developments going into a neighborhood to see how they would impact it. Thank you. Mr. Narkowitz. Yeah, infill was a was a big topic when we did the sustainable Northampton plan a few years ago. That was, you know, obviously one of the buzzwords in terms of, you know, how do we go ahead and, and look at the gr overall growth of our city and do we concerns about having too much sprawl in certain areas and where we want to have development happen. Um, but, but I think what's ha what's come out of that, though, has been a real slow and thoughtful look in terms of, you know, looking very incrementally almost at the neighborhood level, which is, I think, how you have to do it. And I know here in, in, uh, in this area, the Bay State Village Association, you know, did a really thoughtful kind of neighborhood survey. They, they, they did um, surveys, they've held forums, they've met about the issues of infill and about some of the challenges and what some of the pluses and some of the minuses are. And I think that's been really great because that helps inform the city in terms of what it needs to do to meet some of those goals. So I know, for example, one of the things that came out of the Bay State Village process was, you know, a concern about, well, obviously supporting some of the reuse of old buildings, which I think is a great thing. Um, the other piece that came out of it was the, um, was the idea of looking at more home occupations, possibly. Um, and I know that's a conversation that's now trickled up from that neighborhood level up to the Zoning Revisions Committee, and it's now being discussed in the Planning Board. So I think that's a great model for how, if we're going to look at reusing uh, buildings, if we're going to look at opportunities for, uh, for more density in certain neighborhoods, it's a way to make sure that we're keeping in the character of those neighborhoods and, and, and that, that it's what the citizens in those neighborhoods uh, are, really want in their backyard. So I think that's the kind of model we need to do when we look at infill, um, is really have it be neighborhood-based, really make sure that we're trying to stick with the character of the neighborhoods we have, while also trying to achieve the goals, which is you know, avoiding neighborhood sprawl, trying to reuse old buildings, trying to diversify uses for old buildings, um, which is also you know, an overall, one of our overall sustainability goals. Mr. Bardsley, uh, rebuttal. Well, a, a couple of... Uh key things we need to keep in mind is whenever we do things, we need to look back and evaluate it to see whether or not it's been successful, whether or not it's met the goals. The city doesn't have a good track record on doing that. Um, and a lot of times they just move on without looking back. I think King Street is a perfect example. Um, and the other, with infill, they, they talk about limiting the development on the outlying uh, sections of town, but unless there's some type of mechanism to ensure that, that's not going to happen. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Our next question is going to go to Mr. Narkowitz first. Are there opportunity? Oh, this is a loaded question. <laughs> Are there opportunities for contracting out services now provided by the city staff? Where would you draw the line between potential savings from contracting on the one hand and good labor relations or management control on the other? Well, certainly uh, that is a the, the issue of labor control is is an important one because we obviously. You know, we are a, a union city. We have, you know, we have uh, collective bargaining. We have uh, city employees that mostly are unionized. So, uh, obviously, you have to be very careful about that issue of if you're talking about outsourcing. Um, you have to look at that very carefully. But, you know, I do think the city right now does does uh, subcontract out for for lots of services, engineering services. We subcontract out for for plowing. Uh, we have other contracts uh, for um, for work that's done in our schools. Uh, consulting services, professional development services. So there, there is a lot of that stuff that goes on. Um, I do think that one of the w one of the issues I spoke about earlier, which is regionalization, is is an opportunity where you can have that same effect, where you can try to create an economy of scale, where you can bring um, bring together communities that may have a shared uh, service that they have to provide, 
and be able to try to do that collectively. We've done that really successfully with veteran services, been able to bring in more staff to be able to deliver the services while also serving veterans in, in several different communities. Um, but I, I do think that the issue of looking at um, are there services that we could provide uh, more effectively with private help, I think you have to be open to that, but you also have to be mindful of that issue of of uh, the fact that we do have city employees that have contracts, and we have to make sure that we're not uh, running afoul of those. Okay, Mr. Bardsley. As David pointed out, the city um, does uh, use a lot of uh, services from outside providers who, who are not city employees. And we, uh, <clears throat> when those decisions have been made, they've been studied very carefully in ways the, the pros and cons of the current services being delivered by city employees. That, that's an area I would go very, very cautiously in when I looked at, look at it. Um, I think uh, our city employees are doing a tremendous job uh, right now. I think um, instead of talking about uh, reducing some of the jobs and, and putting uh, services out to private contractors, I think we should do look more at supporting the current employees and both um, bolstering morale and uh, giving them a positive message. I think what happened at the end of the last school year in June in relationship to the city school teachers was deplorable. Um, I thought that was treating the, the city union, their representation very, very poorly. And that has been echoed in other ways. So that is something that I would uh, make as much more of a priority is respecting and, uh, tr and supporting our uh, employees. One of the things that happens with, uh, when you contract out, a lot of times the quality of the service diminishes and you don't have control of, that, of the quality of that service. And sometimes it, in fact, in the long run, ends up to be more expensive. And I think there's a, uh, an examples of that within our country's military, where they have contracted out a lot of the, the jobs they used to do for enlisted men and women and now uh, uh, they are contracting sometimes to the same people are doing those jobs that used to do them when they were in the military and the government is paying up to three times as much. So it's not always a, uh, uh, the uh, panacea that some people think it is. Mr. Narkowitz, rebuttal. Uh, no rebuttal, just, uh, just to expand a little bit. I think, I, I, I think again, you know, we, we've, we've reached a point where we're trying to provide city services with less and less resources, and we've, we've really put a lot on our city employees who do a great job, whether it's the plowing in the winter, whether it's teachers uh, trying to teach, uh, trying to teach with, with, with less, bigger classrooms and less resources. So I do think that one of the ways, if we're, if we're really concerned about city services, is not really to look outside, but to figure out, you know, what, what can we do to bring more resources to the employees that we have to allow them to do the work that they need to do uh, as well as they've been doing it. Thank you, gentlemen. Our next question is uh, going to go to Mr. Barsley first. How do you, def <laughs> uh, I did not word this. Uh, I don't want to get into the old hamp or old no-ho debate. Uh, but how do you define old hamp and new hamp? Do these groups have inherently conflicting views of the future they would want for Northampton? And how do you align yourself with these views? Uh, HAMP and NOHO are not terms I use uh, very often in my vocabulary at all. Um, and when I do use them, it's to disown them. Uh, I think it's another way of labeling people. I have never been big into labeling people. Um, I feel the same way when it's used on a local level about liberal, conservative, uh, Democrat, Republican. Those are more ways to divide people within a community. And I think city leaders have to find ways to include everybody to reach out to people. And that includes, first and foremost, listening. And I, um, as simple as it sounds, uh, I built a career on being able to listen to people with a very uh, wide range of views and experiences. Um, and when you listen to people, they feel obviously heard and included. And you don't have to agree with them, but that's the, uh, the beginning part. There's a lot of folks in this town who do not feel like they've been listened to, they do not feel included, and it's not just the ones that others give the HAMP label. It includes 
uh, small business owners downtown. It includes young people who have been born here, and it includes young people who have moved here from other places. It includes people who have retired um, here and can't afford to live here or have other concerns. So I think we need to get beyond that, um, that what I consider a very false uh, uh, dichotomy. I have been criticized for some of the people who have supported me last time around. Uh, there was a very infamous email that was written um, and passed around to some of the people in this audience criticizing me for some of my supporters. And I am proud of the people who have support me because that means I am working very hard to do outreach and to include people um, in city government. And I think you need more of that and not to stop at these labels. Thank you. Mr. Narkowitz. Uh, I agree uh, that, that, the, uh, that this uh, distinction which people try to bring up from time to time, <laughs> ham versus noho, is, is, is a false one. It's, it's really, uh, it's, it, I, I, I don't, it's not something that I use. It's not something that I think that people, uh, that's really true to what's going on in, in the community right now. There's you know, young people, old people, there's people that have moved away, that have come back, there are people who have been here their whole lives, there are people who have been here you know, uh, five years. But the, the bottom line is that we have a community that, uh, that, that cares deeply about this city. There, we live here because we love this city. We, we share the same values about wanting to have you know, safe streets, we want to have good schools, you know, we want to have a strong local economy, we want to have jobs, we want to have good homes. Uh, those kinds of things. So I think we all share the same values, and I think the important thing for the mayor to try to do is to reach out to all parts of the city and be the mayor for all Northampton. Um, and I think the important piece there is uh, in the way that city government reaches out and tries to include people in the decision-making process. And I think that's an important piece. I think having uh, working with the neighborhood-based groups around the city that have really formed in different parts of the city because they care about the neighborhoods that they live in and they care about the city. I think those are the things that we need to focus on. Not whether someone, you know, where they were born or, or whether they've lived here for five years or ten years. Everybody has something to contribute. Everybody lives here because they love the city. And I think we have to make sure that we include all those voices in the conversation and make sure that when we're looking at the things that we're doing to, to move the city forward to improve it, that we have that in mind at all times. Mr. Barsley, do you have anything you add to that? Well, uh, it's more than just uh, wanting to include everybody. I think we could all agree on that. But it's having uh, the skills and having the background of uh, being able to do that. And I have done a lot of outreach. If you look at the people who have supported me in my campaigns, they run the gamut. Uh, people have made comments about how diverse my, uh, my gatherings are of supporters. It, it's people throughout the community. So I, I think you need to have that back record, uh, the track record that you can do that. Thank you, gentlemen. The next question will go to Mr. Narkowitz first. Can you give one or two examples of new initiatives or programs for the city that you have been or are now particularly passionate about, and why are these so important to you? Well, I think one of the ones that uh, I'm quite passionate about is our city's traffic calming program, which is a program that I helped develop. I, um, I was the chair of the Transportation and Parking Commission, uh, uh, wrote the city's traffic calming manual. We've had a long-standing problem in our city with neighborhood traffic safety, with speeding in neighborhoods, and that's been a, 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 a subject of several commissions and committees, and it's one of the programs that I really worked on extensively, put together a neighborhood-based program uh, where we were actually able to get out into neighborhoods, people could submit applications to us uh, with issues that they had with traffic problems in their neighborhood. We're evaluating them. We're starting to actually now put measures out in neighborhoods. I know here in, in the Bay State Village area, we're testing some rubberized speed humps on, on Riverside Drive. There's been work done in uh, Jackson Street and Grove Street in Ward 3. So I'm really excited about that program because I think it's been a long-standing concern. It's an issue of livability for people in their neighborhoods. It's an issue for safety for people, for kids going to school. And I think it's important now that the city's actually addressing it in a, in a very real way. And we're actually doing it in a way that's neighborhood-driven, that's neighborhood-based, and we're using data collection to make sure that it's done fairly and objectively. So that's one issue. I think the other one is energy. I think energy has been a program, uh, has been an initiative that I've been really involved in, uh, particularly in this latest term of the city council. 
Uh, we've put forward initiatives for trying to come up with a, a new program called the PACE Financing Program, which is Property Assessed Clean Energy, uh, to try to help homeowners and businesses be able to improve their energy of their homes and be able to not only make it more comfortable, to reduce their expenses, to make it easier to live in their home uh, longer because of the reduced expense. So I think those are a couple of really exciting initiatives that are not only green, but they're also quality of life initiatives that really improve the quality of people's lives in the city. And I've been proud to work on them, and I will be working to advance them even further as mayor. Excellent. Mr. Bardsley. Uh, one accomplishment that I am um, very uh, proud of is the uh, formation of the Northampton Human Rights Commission. Uh, when I became a, uh, a counselor, there were a lot uh, of issues in the city around uh, individuals' uh, rights. And so I did the research, I visited communities in uh, Boston and looked at the, uh, the different uh, models that were out there and wrote up a proposal, um, formed a uh, working committee, and we uh, passed, the city council passed the Human Rights uh, Commission ordinance and that commission has been up and running and doing a, uh, a fantastic job over the past, uh, I think it's been over a decade now. Um, and it functions on its own. That's one of the things I get um, I'm proud about it. Here's this accomplishment, and I deliberately stepped back. I did not put myself on the commission. And it is functioning and surviving on its own. Another thing I'm, a, I'm proud of is the, uh, the ballot referendum on the expansion of the landfill. And it wasn't so much as the outcome, but it's giving the citizens a voice and giving them the opportunity to set the direction. And without that referendum, uh, the landfill would have gone through. And it was because of the hard work of two citizens and Councilor Marianne Labarge and myself that that actually made it to the citizens to be able to vote on it. And a, a third one is the work around best practices. There was a best practices uh, uh, ad hoc committee. It made 10 recommendations. I think they're very important recommendations. Um, the city has only made a significant uh, movement on one of those 10, and that's the one for a charter review. And, but there are another nine recommendations sitting out there that there has been no work done on them in the past two years. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Narkowitz, rebuttal. Uh, actually, the best practices is another initiative. Actually, uh, Councillor Barsley and I co-sponsored the resolution that created that committee. We served on the committee. And I've actually been working on not just one of those recommendations, but several of them. Uh, we've been working on, well, first of all, the charter review piece was one that I've moved forward. Uh, we've also been trying to make reforms in the city council process and our public comment process in the way we try to hold more public forums on issues. So I think there have been other areas, that's another area that I've been a leader on, is reforming city government and trying to put into, put into practice some of those recommendations of the Best Practices Committee. Thank you. The next question will go to Mr. Barsley first. Northampton is, a, is, is as diverse as its population with many provincial uh, cultures, such as Bay State Village and Florence Village. Uh, how do you balance their needs along with the city as a whole? Well, that goes uh, back to the basic skill of listening. I think you need to go out into those places and listen to the concerns of people to see what their needs and their uh, differences are. Uh, it's not for the city to determine that. And I have um, spent a lot of time in Florence. Uh, I have my uh, headquarters there, as I did last year. I talk to a lot of people. I'm in the businesses. I'm in the, uh, the communities. I'm hearing what people talk. Some of the concerns overlap and some of them don't. But I, I'm very much uh, for the, uh, the residents kind of, um, identifying their needs and determining what, uh, uh, what they uh, need from the city and what the city's agenda should be for them, not that the city makes their own agenda. Um, several years ago, uh, I think it was probably about 10 years ago, there was drafted a, uh, called something called the Florence Plan and it was a package of um, uh, proposed ordinances. And that was tr being pushed through the city council as a package. And when I started to look at that when I was uh, on the city, I was the chair of the ordinance committee, 
Um, I really fought to, um, to break up that bundle and to look at them individually because I knew some of those had uh, going to have impacts and I don't think everybody really knew uh, what those impacts would be and there wasn't that type of discussion. So to me that's an example where um, of, of my leadership and my uh, insight in that I said this isn't right for, for the community and, and to um, to put it back so there was more opportunity for in, um, input on specific measures. And that's, I think, the model that we need to do, is work with the community to address those concerns and needs. Mr. Nargowitz. Yeah, I think, I think one of the strengths that, that you have uh, in, in, the, in, the, um, in both in Florence and also Bay State Village is the fact that you both have strong uh, associations, like the, the two that are sponsoring tonight's debate. And uh, since I've been a city councilor at large, I've tried to really interface with those organizations to, to uh, learn from them. Uh, attended, there have been uh, regular luncheons of the Florence Civic and Business Association, uh, which is an opportunity for city, city officials, councilors, um, in, in my case as council president and now more recently as acting mayor, I've attended those meetings as a way to really understand what some of the issues are because the, the neighborhood associations and the civic associations really have their finger on the pulse of, of many of the issues. I, I know at last week's, uh, or last, this month's installment, the big issue was, you know, what's going to happen with the mobile station downtown and, and what some of the ramifications of that are. Um, and I know out in uh, Bay State Village, there's been a lot of work around traffic calming which has been one of the other issues. So I think it's important, um, uh, every neighborhood in our city has a lot of unique characteristics. We're all part of the same city, uh, but there are specific issues and needs in every, in every one of our uh, neighborhoods. And so I think it's important for a mayor, for a city council, for any elected official to really try to interface with those groups, to try to be in those communities, attending events, and really trying to understand the specific needs so that the city can try to help and deliver whatever services, whatever support we can to assist those specific parts of the city. Thank you. Mr. Bardsley, do you have a rebuttal? Well, uh, to add a little bit to what David said, we, we basically agree on the, the approach. I have a lot of um, experience in, in doing it. I have done it, for example, I mentioned earlier in working with downtown businesses when I was a ward counselor in forming a, a forum there where the businesses could talk out their uh, problems. I also did it in Ward 2 when there was the, uh, the overlay district being proposed and I was the one who outreached to the citizens there to listen to their concerns and to voice them at the council. So I have done that. Excellent. Thank you. The uh, last question of tonight is going to go to Mr. Narkowitz first. Um, and you can see right through this one. On our webs on both your websites, you both promote transparency. Oh, see what I did there? Never mind. <laughs> Please define transpa transparency in the context of municipal government and provide an example in Northampton's government where transparency does exist and where it does not. And once again, this goes to Mr. Narkowitz first. Well, I think in terms of, I mean, in terms of transparency, I think, I mean, the idea, at least in the city government context, is that people have full access to all the information uh, that's available, that they have full access to understanding the decision-making process, and they have access to understanding, you know, how they can participate in that process. So in terms of, you know, when we talk about how do we make the system more transparent, you know, we've been doing a lot of work recently with the new open meeting law that's been implemented, trying to put, uh, make it really easy for people to find out when meetings are happening, what the agendas are for those meetings. Um, and, and, uh, and clearly spelling out what those agenda items are. So I think some of the work we're doing in that area is an example of where we're really trying to make the city process more transparent, putting all the documents, all the minutes, all those kinds of things on, uh, making them easily available to people so that they understand the decision-making process, they understand, they have access to documents. I think the work that we've been doing on the city council, for example, with our new finance director, who's been uh, publishing her finance director's corner as a way to try to put more and more information out to the public so that the decisions we make um, have greater scrutiny from the public, greater understanding from the public. In terms of where we can do a better job, I do think that there's still many areas of our city government where uh, there, are, uh, there are decisions that are made um, uh, that, that I don't think people understand or they're engaged in enough. I think some of the issues around our, our uh, public works 
and some of the issues around uh, infrastructure and, and, the, and the decisions that are made in that area. I think we need to engage people more in that and try to open up that process so that people have a better um, understanding of how it works, a better understanding of how those numbers work, and that they can try to have more input into the process. Thank you. Mr. Bardsley. Uh, I agree with what David has said uh, so far. I don't think it goes far enough. I mean, their transparency is one element of it, and I would uh, push to have the government uh, process of each department uh, more open. Um, we have to push for inclusion. We have to do outreach to underrepresented uh, uh, parts of the city who feel disconnected and disaffiliated. Um, we need to have accountability for uh, decision makers and those in charge with implementing decisions, and then we have to evaluate the decisions that we uh, that we made. Um, we have to also restore what I call critical thinking to the discussions that go on in uh, in in the city, especially in the city council. All too often, it seems that a decision isn't being made um, based on the uh, merits of that particular issue. A lot of times it looks like there are other factors that are um, weighing in on how people come to a, a decision. I remember in the discussion of the overlay district when I was posing some concerns that had been brought to me by citizens who had felt left out of the process, and one of the co my, my colleagues at the time said, the more we discuss this, the more confused I get. Let's just vote on it and get it over with. Um, to me, that is a sign that somebody had made up their minds and not on the facts. There were other things at play on that. And all too often that is the case. So I would work to make sure that the, the, the information that is needed is out there in the very beginning and that there is a robust discussion involving citizens at the very uh, beginning. Um, there, what happens is that there is a lot of uh, resistance and when citizens get angry, um, a lot of times they end up suing the city. So I will work to include citizens so their only recourse for a fair hearing is in taking the city to court. Thank you. Um, Mr. Narkowitz, uh, rebuttal on that. I think the important thing, I think it's, I think it's important to, that we have the discussion about transparency and about open government. I think it's also important to look at people's records on what they've actually done to try to open up city government. And that's been something that I've done in the short time that I've been city government, uh, whether it's trying to, trying to create a, a better balance between the, the legislative branch and the executive branch, uh, uh, whether it's been trying to uh, improve the city's website, whether it's been trying to create programs like the traffic pro calming program, which is neighborhood driven, neighborhood based. So I think it's important to not only look at how we talk about these issues, but what have we actually done to put in place real reform? Okay, I just looked at my clock and we actually do have time for like sort of a half question. So I'm going to add something to that last question and you have 30 seconds to respond with no rebuttal. What will you do to make the city more transparent to those who do not use the internet? And I put that, yeah, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Uh, I put that to Mr. Bardsley first. Uh, we need to do more outreach. We need to go into the, the neighborhoods and talk to the different organizations. As uh, David mentioned early, there's a number of uh, uh, neighborhoods in the city that have organizations. The city needs to go out there and talk to people and present the information to them. We also need to um, uh, include people in recruiting them for committees. So I would uh, do a very aggressive job for uh, committee recruitment. Thank you. Mr. Narkowitz. Well, I think we have one great tool, which is here tonight, which is NCTV. I think that's a great tool uh, for, for trying to get more information out to the city. I think uh, I know that Mayor Ford used to use NCTV as a way to try to communicate with citizens about the city, about processes that are happening, about what's happening in departments. I think that's a great way to reach people, and I would try to, to, to use that, as well as our library system, which is also a great way to get people information about about events that are going on. And finally, as I mentioned in my previous answer, the neighborhood associations, which have great informal networks that they've already built up that the city really needs to formally tap into. Thank you. Um, and we're going to give you both two minutes each for closing statements. And we're going to start with by the luck of the draw at the beginning of the event uh, with Mr. Narkowitz. 
Thank you, and, and thank you again to the uh, organizers of the event, the Bay State uh, Village Association, the Florence Civic and Business Association for putting this all together. Um, I want to say a thank you to my wife, Yelena, who's here tonight, and uh, to my daughters, Emma and Zoe, who are at home and hopefully working on their homework uh, for, their, uh, <laughs> for their constant love and support. Um, running for mayor is, a, is, a, is a, a, a big task. It's a daunting task and I couldn't do it without the support and the love that, that you've provided me. I believe that Northampton needs a mayor with a positive vision and a steady proven track record of leadership and results. A mayor who will unite our city and work hard every day for all of its people to find innovative solutions to the challenges we face. I've been somebody in city government that's tried to work on bringing people together to find solutions to problems, whether it's the issue of traffic, uh, trying to come up with neighborhood-driven solutions to how do we deal with this problem of making our city streets safe, whether it's the issue of energy and how do we do a better job of conserving energy in our own house, in the city's house, but how do we reach out to the community, to businesses, to homeowners, to try to help them uh, save on energy and figure out ways to do that, uh, whether it's reforming government, not just talking about change and talking about reform, but actually implementing real reform in our city government. I think that's the key when you look at who can actually put forth a vision, but then who can also deliver on that vision and produce meaningful results. My experience at the federal, state, and local level, combined with my record of community leadership and service, has uniquely prepared me for this position. I believe I have the experience, the ideas, the energy, and the commitment to offer a new generation of leadership to move our great city forward. I thank you all, and I hope I can earn your vote for mayor on November 8th. Thank you, Mr. Narkowitz. Mr. Bardsley, your closing statement. My overarching uh, uh, goal for Northampton and for the future is that it remains a community where working middle class people can afford to live and work here. Um, the United States is becoming increasingly polarized between the super wealthy and everybody else. Um, every day we can see examples of that in the newspaper and on TV where the working middle class has been hit hard economically. And at the local level, I pledge to do everything a mayor can do to keep this a place that we can all afford to live and enjoy. Um, that includes ensuring fiscal responsibility, involving more citizens in the democratic process of decision making, protecting our natural resources for the next generation. I am a public servant with a solid resume. I have the maturity, the wisdom, the compassion, and the integrity to serve Northampton well. On November 8th, please vote for the candidate who is up to being the mayor for all of Northampton, everybody's mayor. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Before our closing remark, I'm going to put in one more plug for the League of Women Voters who is putting together a forum on the Community Preservation Act, and that's coming up on Wednesday, October 26 at 7 o'clock at the JFK Middle School Community Room. Uh, they will be having a forum hearing arguments uh, for and against passing the question that would repeal the CPA. Uh, that's one of the many things that is on either the flyers that have been handed out or are available at the entrance. Uh, I would uh, personally like to thank everybody from the Northampton High School who have been very accommodating to us for both this and the forum that we had for the at-large candidates. So please, let's give us a round of applause for the high school. I'd also like to thank the Bay State Village Association and the Florence Civic and Business Association for putting this together tonight. Let's please give them a warm welcome. And on behalf of everybody, not only in the two associations that sponsored this forum, but everybody across the city who may be watching this on NCTV or look, reading about it in the paper or whatever the case may be, Thank you very much to both Mr. Narkowitz and Mr. Bardsley for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.